We welcome you, friends, again to another session of the Adventist Roundtable. We're going to discuss a very important message this day with Dr. Stanish and, and uh, Pastor Ray DiCarlo. The 1888 message, its acceptance and rejection. Now, we know that there has been a, a tremendous almost war going on for almost a hundred years over this whether we accepted the message in 1888 or whether we rejected the message in 88. Books have been written on both sides. Mm. And the tragedy is that we're still here today in this world because of the rejection of that message back there. What was it? This is why we want to bring you this, this uh, presentation so that you can understand what that message was and that it, it, we're still here in this world because we have not yet accepted it even to this day. Now, I think that without a question that we have to understand that, that Wagner and Jones and Ellen White came together, not by their own volition, but by the act of God, by a calling. These two young ministers came together with Ellen White, the prophet, and at the Minneapolis conference there was tremendous presentations made. It, uh, it was over mainly the, the law and the, and the gospel, and uh, as they entered into that message of 1888, a tremendous war uh, evolved out of what they were telling, the, the leaders and the, and the people that were there in Minneapolis. And uh, the, the, as we find that the prophet of the Lord wrote, and he said, she said, she said that our preaching is drier than the hills of Gaboa without dew or rain because they were preaching law, 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 and they, they had a missing element, a missing component in that message, and that, that's why they had no power in their preaching. That, that is very clearly uh, given to us in selected messages on volume, uh, volume three of selected messages uh, in... Um, on page 168 when she made this important statement and it falls in the chapter of the Minneapolis Conference. Elder E.J. Wagner had the privilege granted him of speaking plainly and presenting his views upon justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ in relationship to the law. This was no new light, but it was the old light placed where it should be in the third angel's message. And so what she is telling us here is that what Wagner and Jones and Ellen White were presenting in that message was not something new, but it was reinstating something that was always old. And what was it? It was the gospel, the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Presented to Adam and Eve, to presented to, to Abraham, presented to David, to all the patriarchs of the Old Testament, and it, we find that John the Baptist is preaching it, Jesus was preaching it, and after his death and resurrection, the disciples continue to preach that dynamic message. And what was it? Victory over sin through the power of Jesus Christ. Mm. Now listen, as it goes on. This was no new light, but it was old light, placed where it should be in the third angel's message. What is the burden of that message? John sees a people. He says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. This people John beholds just before he sees the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and, a, and in his hand a sharp sickle. That's... Verse 14 of Revelation 14. So uh, that very clearly states that we have come right down to the end of it all because there's where Jesus stands with a sharp sickle and with a crown on his head. He's about ready to come to this earth to gather the fruits of that gospel. And the faith of Jesus now, she says, has been overlooked and treated in an indifferent, careless manner. It has not occupied the prominent position in which was revealed to John. <clears throat> the faith of Christ as the sinner's only hope has been largely left out, not only of the discourses given, but of the religious experience of very many who claim to believe the third angel's message. And friends, this is what was happening, is the leaders and the pastors 
had the law, but they did not have the faith of Jesus that gave them the power to preach the third angel's message in its entirety. And here God was making one great desperate effort now to put the faith of Jesus and the law together to make up a gospel. And that would have brought the third angel's message to its conclusion. That we are told in, in volume 7 of the commentary 984, this startling statement by the prophet in which she says, the, the time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. The fourth angel, that was written in 1902, my friend, 1892, and the fourth angel came down to join the third angel's message to swell it to a loud cry and friends it couldn't happen because there wasn't enough there to do it the leaders of the church the pastor of the church didn't understand it remember what she said she said that it is an experience she says there that as the sinner's only hope has been largely left out, not only of the discourses given, but of the religious experience of very many who claim to believe the third angel's message. The third angel's message is an experience in Jesus Christ. It is by faith that we understand that we can't do anything, but Jesus can do it if we're willing to let him do it. But we've got to be willing to merge our will so completely with God's will that our mind is God's, our thoughts are God's, our life is God's, and all the power that God has is there to help us do it. And that is what to make a demonstration. Jesus was ready to make a demonstration in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in, in 1888. But it didn't happen, and it hasn't happened for more than a hundred years. I, I want to say that I'll go a little beyond what Elder Spear has said. There was an awesome failure, it is true, of leadership and ministry. But brethren and sisters, the laity came out poorly in, 90, in 1888 also. That's right. If the laity had risen to the message, then God would have fulfilled his desire through his lay people, as he intends to do at the end of time, as we read in the book Great Controversy. And brothers and sisters, it's about time those of us who are lay people cease to put all the responsibility upon the ministry. We're not absolving the ministry and the leadership in no wise, but we have to stand before the God of heaven in judgment ourselves. That's right. And it will be no excuse to state, well, of course I didn't accept the 1888 message. Uh, my pastor didn't accept it, or my conference president didn't accept it. We had a, a wonderful opportunity after, 17, uh, after 1973. You'll remember that a great call came to God's people through the annual council. It was inspired by our world leader, Elder Robert Pearson. And that was a call to re reformation, repentance and reformation. I can remember Colin and myself and Pastor Burnside dining with Pastor Pearson in the year 1985 in his home. And we put to him the question, what happened to that mighty call 12 years ago, as it was at that time? A call that if it had been taken, I believe God could have restored the 1888 message to his church. He could have finished the work. The loud cry could have gone forward and we could have been in heaven Bear this. And Pastor Pearson dropped his head in sorrow and he said, the greatest disappointment of my days as president of the General Conference was the failure of God's people to take hold of that call. He had hoped that it would swell so that in 1975 at the Vienna General Conference that men and women would have risen up to the call and repentance and revival would have come to God's people. But sadly, he said, there was no great will amongst ministry or laity to take up that call. Brothers and sisters, 
We have to redress that situation in our own hearts today. Are we prepared to accept this message and to go forth as God would have us go forth? Remember, Sister White did state, and perhaps I ought to read it, that that message was the Laodicean message. It was the straight testimony. And uh, I believe that it is important that we recognize this fact. Uh, the message given us by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is the message of God to the Laodicean church. And woe be unto anyone who professes to believe the truth and yet does not reflect to others the God-given rays. That's letter 24, 1892. It is the message of God to the Laodicean church. My dear brothers and sisters, are we going to accept God's message to our church here in 1992 or are we going to reject it? And I'm speaking to our lay people as earnestly as I possibly can. As, we, as we look at this uh, situation that uh, really involves the message, the dynamics of righteousness by faith, we have a counterfeit righteousness by faith, which we know is the new theology today. Mm -hmm. And it's raging through Adventism today from our pulpits. Now, Ray, what, uh, with your study, what do you have to say? Well, I want to share um, Russell's concern in uh, an appeal to God's people to see the beauty of this message. There's no question that the servant of the Lord had time and time again in her counsels uh, pinpointed Elder Jones and Wagoner as the messengers that God had used to give this great message to the Adventist people. And there's no question that we as a people have, have rejected that message. The mere fact that we are still on this earth is very evident that we've rejected that message. But I think I want to share just in a, in a, in a way to God's people the beauty of that message and the wonderful message that it has for each and every one who will receive it. When Elder Jones and Wagner were presenting the message that God had given to them, they had been placing the beautiful relationship between the law and the gospel. Now, Elder Spirit, you brought that out before and, and I really appreciated that concept. Because we had, as, as Elder Spirit mentioned, we had been preaching for quite some time. The, the law, the law, the law, void of Jesus Christ. Jones and Wagner began to blend the gospel with Jesus, and the law and the gospel, excuse me, there together and put it in its proper uh, place. And when they presented the righteousness of Jesus Christ, they not only presented it in a way that God would forgive your sins, but they presented the righteousness of Jesus Christ with power. In other words, that God could not only forgive you, but that God could keep you from your sins. That God had the power to keep a person from sinning. And I want to say that, I know we've, we've, it's already been uh, discussed in one of the uh, roundtable discussions, that uh, the fact that what they presented, one of the, one of the centrality or what central aspects of the message of 1888 was the nature of Jesus Christ. Amen. They knew that that, that was a a very vital part to share with God's people. My friends, I want to encourage you to understand that Jesus Christ is not far off, as Ellen White said. He is nigh at hand. He's close to us in the fact that he partook of fallen humanity, that we in return may be partakers of the divine nature and be victorious in Christ. You know, there's several things, I, I or at least several statements I want to share. Um, uh, with uh, those who are watching this video. When the message of righteousness by faith was presented in 1888 by Elder Jones and Wagner, you know, you wonder, well, what was actually rejected? Or what did the, uh, at that time, what was rejected? And what have we, since that time, what have we been rejecting? And, uh, you know, Elder Spirit, you brought out a very important part, the fact that today we have the counterfeit of, of, the, of the righteous by faith in the new theology. 
and, and they will discuss the justification of Jesus Christ. But and I want to understand, friends, the justification that is being preached today by the new theology is not the justification of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. That is very evident. They are stating that a person can be justified while they're still living in their sins. One writer, uh, well, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to have to be very honest with you. I have to be very frank. Uh, it, 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 Morris Venden wrote a book called The Five-Day Plan or whatever. I can't remember the actual title, but that, some of that. But the statement is, is this, that a person can live in, not, quote, known, ongoing, habitual, continual sin. Call it what you want, he says. It's sin and still have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, that's what they're terming justification. My friends, Jesus never came to justify a person in sin, for if he were to do that, he'd have to justify the sin. And Jesus can't justify sin. He'd have to save the devil. And that's the whole point, you see. <laughs> but my, I Really, uh, it, the counterfeit righteousness by faith, Ray, is really unrighteousness by presumption. Yes, it? It, it, absolutely right, Russell. I'm going to read a statement from the pen of inspiration on justification, really what it, it, it's uh, saying here. This is from the Review and Herald, uh, August 19 of 1890. She says, to be justified, or pardoned, which is to be justified, it's the same thing now, to be pardoned in the way that Christ pardons or justifies. It is not only to be forgiven, now catch this, not only to be forgiven, but to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You see, there's justification. But with justification or imputed righteousness comes imparted righteousness or sanctification. Now, I know it's already been discussed, but friends, listen. When a person is justified, they are presently in that state sanctified. Mm -hmm. They have not only received imputed righteousness, but they are imparted righteousness to keep them in that imputed relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And this is what Ellen White referred now, to. Now, what you're saying, Ray, is this, that, that the, the preachers... Uh, prior to 1888 were, were, we had the imputed righteousness, but they didn't understand the imparted righteousness of Christ. It, 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 and it, God was trying to restore imparted righteousness into their preaching. Absolutely. Ron, what, what we have here, really, in essence, they were preaching, and I don't want to say they understood. See, you can't preach imputed righteousness separate from imparted. In other words, even though they, they are distinct in themselves, yet they have a, such a close relationship to each other that it's impossible to separate, separate them. And so they were preaching a justification of an part of imputed righteousness on, only in a limited sense. They yeah. did not understand the completed, full understanding of imputed in relationship to imparted. So what you're saying is the imparted righteousness of Christ gives the power in the imputed experience of justification and, and sanctification. Absolutely. In other words, the, the imparted righteousness of Jesus keeps you in that imputed relationship with Jesus Christ. Of justification. Of justification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that that's why Ellen White wrote here that, that the, the faith of Jesus has been looked out because the faith of Jesus is the imparted. Absolutely. You see, and to <laughs> understand that, friends, you have to go back and see what caused the fall. The fall began when Eve began to lose trust in what God said and believe what the devil was saying. You see, and when she lost the trust in God, she lost the righteousness of God, and therefore she couldn't love like God uh, had created her love. And the restoration of man has to start exactly where it was lost. He has to be restored in trust or faith, and then he can be trusted with righteousness, then he can love as God had created him to love, and that is the restoration of man. You know, Ron, I want to bring out a very important point on this uh, factor. This is why the, the, the doctrine of the nature of Christ is absolutely so crucial. You see, when Jesus came to this earth, he came to demonstrate the relationship between the imputed and parted. In other words, he, he tied the two together, the law and the gospel, and actually demonstrated in fallen humanity the, uh, the, the reality of what it can be like for every individual who lives by the faith of Jesus Christ. That's the whole point. You know, this being the message to the Laodicean church, as we have just discovered from the writings of Sister White, should draw us to see what that message states. Mm. You see, so many people 
without even studying or reading the message of Jones and Wagner are attempting to take the law completely out of the message that we have. My brothers, my sisters, this was not the message of 1888 to remove obedience to the law mm, of God. Right. Far from it. The purpose of that message was to see Jesus as the center of every Amen. one of the Ten Commandments and to see him as the pot <coughs> potency for our ability to keep that law. And we can see that in the message for we're told in verse 21 at the conclusion of the message to the seventh church, the Laodicean church, <coughs> Revelation 3.21, to him that overcometh. Amen. What does that mean? That means overcoming sin. That's right. That's right. It means obeying the commandments of God, walking as Jesus walked. Will I grant to sit on my throne? There's the promise. Even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Amen. It would be a total injustice to the message of 1888 to remove victory, overcoming, obedience from that message. That was a central aspect of the message. It was the aspect that Jesus is the one who provides the power for overcoming. He is the example, just as he overcame in the same nature as us, with the same power of the Holy Spirit, he invites us to do so. Indeed, this is one of the great promises of Scripture. We will sit with him on mm. his throne. Now, Amen. Ray, you brought up that um, Wagner and Jones presented the great message of rightness by faith in the setting of the nature of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Now, a lot of our, our opponents on this, uh, our understanding of this message, are saying that we, uh, we have never taken a stand in the Seventh-day Adventist Church on the nature of Christ. I mean, here are two men called by God to, to join with a prophet of God and to present a, a, the, the missing link in their, in their preaching, and in their very center of their preaching is the nature of Christ. Listen to what Wagner has to say in his book, Christ and His Righteousness, page 26 and 27. A little thought will be sufficient to show anybody that if Christ took upon himself the likeness of man in order that he might redeem man, it must have been sinful man that he was made like. Mm -hmm. For it is sinful man that he came to redeem. Death could not have any power over a sinless man, as Adam was in Eden, and it could not have had any power over Christ if the Lord had not laid upon him the iniquity of Saul. Moreover, the fact that Christ took upon himself the flesh, not of a sinless being, but of a sinful man, that is, that the flesh which he assumed had all the weakness and sinful tendency, tendencies to which fallen man, uh, fallen human nature is subject, is shown by the statement that he, he, he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. David had all the passions of human nature. He says of himself, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, what we really see in this presentation that uh, Wagner made back there in 1888 was that Jesus came in the fallen nature. That was the very center of the righteousness by faith message to make Jesus not only our mediator, but to make Jesus our example. And he couldn't be an example to the fallen human beings unless he came down to where the level for where fallen human beings were. He came, it says in Desire of Ages, 149 and 117, that he came after 4,000 years of falling, he came right down to the lowest level that he could to show that as he overcame by the power of the Holy Spirit and resisted all temptation and, and continued through his life as a sinless fallen human being, that we could follow his example. I think of this statement. It's found in Christ's Object Lessons 96, uh, 97, 98. It says, true obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, love for the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right, because all right doing is pleasing to God. Amen. Uh, just, I would just mention uh, that that was page 49, not 149 of yeah. Desire of Ages. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I do that because I am praying 
that our believers will be dotting these, these references mm. down Amen. and going back in earnestness to see whether the things that have been presented during this round table are verily the word of God. Amen. We are not asking that you accept our word on anything. Amen. I just thank God that he's given in this round table to us Elder Spear, that he has such a profound knowledge of where to find all these marvelous statements Amen. in the spirit of prophecy. It's been a great blessing to me and I know Amen. to Ray, Amen. and I hope that we've been able to add some other perspectives, and I thank God for the great gift that he has. Praise the Lord. You know, I want to reiterate again this uh, statement in Testimonies to Ministers 91. Sister White was writing about the 1888 message, and this is what she said, that that message presented justification through faith in the surety. Mm. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to the commandments of God. You know, so many of our people today believe that obedience to God is not part of righteousness by faith. I have just read you some very clear and plain words. I'm going to read them a second time. To reject these words is to do so at the peril of our souls. The servant of the Lord under inspiration says that the 1888 message presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Brothers and sisters, let no man deceive you. The righteousness of Christ includes obedience to all the commandments, which indeed is sanctification. Mm. Let me say this, friends. One sin took Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, and one sin is unforsaken and unconfessed is going to keep any of us from going back in. If, if, if God could save man in sin, I mean, he would have never taken Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. He would have slapped their hands and said, you can't do that anymore. But the breaking of God's law was so, uh, so destructive, it would not only destroy this world, it would destroy the whole universe if God would allow it to go on. And so God had to take desperate measures. He had to, to come down as the creator of the world and stand in front of two sinners and promise them that he would take their place and what was their place, friends? It was death. He had to come down to the level of where fallen human beings were, and Ellen White makes it very clear that is exactly where he came down to. He came down to the, it says, clad in the vestments of humanity, the Son of God came down to the level of those he wished to save. In him was no guile or sinfulness. He was ever pure and undefiled, yet he took upon him our sinful nature, clothing his divinity with humanity that he might associate with fallen human beings. He sought to regain that for man that which by disobedience Adam had lost for himself and for the world. So he came down to the level of where we were. And friends, you and I can never in this world ever under evaluate what he did through the endless ages of eternity. If you're in with, with Jesus in the eternal world, you'll never be able to, to, to understand the tremendous gift that heaven made in giving Jesus to this world. It says in, in the Desire of Ages on page 25, Christ was treated as we deserve that we might be treated as he deserved. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share that we might be treated as he deserves. And with his stripes we are healed. Mm. Oh, friends, as we study this important message, the message of righteousness by faith, friends, it leads us to an experience of humility because that's what Jesus did. In his humility, he came down to where we were, and he was rejected by the church. He was rejected by humanity, and yet in all of that rejection, he cried out in his dying moments to his father, forgive them, God, they don't know what they're doing. 
And find as we come to the final moments in our probationary time and we see the church is doing exactly what it did back there in Christ's day. It's rejecting Jesus Christ. Now that's hard for some people to accept. But the message of righteousness by faith presented to this church in 1888 is a rejection of Jesus Christ. The prophet of the Lord says so. Mm -hmm. It's rejecting Jesus. And it's a rejecting a counterfeit Christ in his place who says you can be saved in sin rather than from sin. Now look, if we accept the counterfeit, then we make the cross of Christ ridiculous because Jesus really didn't need to die if, if, if the law, the violated law, that if, it can, if we can be saved by sinning, by violating the law and still go to heaven, then what need was there of a cross? Right? I want to go back and uh, discuss a little bit of, once more, of the beauty of, of the forgiveness of God, the pardoning Amen. power of God. Rarely do we really understand that uh, when we come before God and confess our sins, the power that God has for us. My friends, I want to read to you several statements from the pen of inspiration. I want you to listen very careful to the, her words, to the, the, the in, pen of inspiration. This is on imputed righteousness. Well, keep in mind, my friends, imputed righteousness not only carries with it the pardoning power of God to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you of your sins, but my friends, it carries with it also the power of God to keep you from that very sin. Let me read to you several statements. Uh, this is Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1098. She says, By receiving His imputed righteousness... Through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, we become like Him. Now, friend, very simple statement, a very profound statement, though. When we receive the, the imputed righteousness of Jesus, friends, we're transformed. There is a transformation that takes place in the life of the individual who receives the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when they're transformed, my friends, they're transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. They receive that power, that power from God. And I want you to know that that power, uh, and I want to share a text with you real fast on, on this. It's found in the book of Jude, and it's the first verse, and I want to show you something. I don't know how many have, have ever even looked at this and recognized uh, what this passage is saying. Jude, there in, uh, in, of course, the first verse, it's only one chapter here. Because I, I want to share a, a very beautiful passage of what it means. Again, justification, sanctification, imputed, imparted. Uh, and then, of course, when a person is receiving the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, they are presently sanctified. Now, when I say presently sanctified, I didn't say they were sanctified in a completed sense that they no longer are, need any more sanctification. Sanctification is a work of a lifetime. But listen, it's not a lifetime of, work in your li uh, of overcoming your sins. My friend, sanctification is a lifetime of obedience. Amen. A lifetime of maintaining that connection with Jesus Christ Amen. in that imputed righteousness. Now look, Jude 1, 1, it says this, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and listen, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Sanctification, the Bible teaches, is the process whereupon God preserves you in Christ. Amen. Praise and God. sanctification is the Ooh. lifetime of being preserved in Jesus. Mm -hmm. read, and, the, read the 24th verse with them. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Well, the 24th verse is, is, is the classic aspect. How does God keep you preserved? Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding Joy. Amen. What and preservation, eh? Amen, Praise yes, Lord. amen. Praise and that's the beauty of it. Let me go on and just a few more statements here yeah. of some of the beautiful things that Ellen White had to say about the 1888 message because I think it's a classic. And I know that our brethren uh, would uh, love to hear some of these things. Review and Herald, November 8, 1892. She says, He would have uh, comprehend something of his love in giving his son to die that he might counteract evil. Remove the defiling stains of sin from the workmanship of God and reinstate the lost, elevating, and nobling soul to its original purity through Christ's imputed righteousness. 
Notice that it's through the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ that we are reinstated, elevated, and ennobled to the original purity that God wants us to be. Amen. Beautiful. And that's through the Amen. imputed righteousness. Amen. Friends, can you believe? Praise Listen, the Lord. This comes through. My friend, do you believe this is a free gift? Mm. A beautiful gift that God is offering mm. every man, woman, and child if they'll accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Accept them, my friends, by faith. Yeah. By faith. Do you realize, my friends, by faith you receive the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, and by faith you receive the imparted righteousness? Amen. All done by faith, a Amen. free gift that Amen. God is offering to you and, and I. The tragedy that I see, Ray, is that very few Seventh-day Adventists understand it, and when they hear it, it's so foreign to them. They say, it can't be right because I've tried for you know, all my life to try to overcome, and I'm still thinking evil thoughts, and I still you know, have lustful thinking, and I'm still losing my temper. My friends, it is because there has not been that full commitment to God. It is because that, that you do not really believe that God has enough power to keep you from sin. Listen to this from the Review and Herald, March 10th, 1904. He who has not sufficient faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from sinning has not the faith that will give him entrance into the kingdom of God. Mm. And these other statements, it says in, uh, in uh, the Faith I Live By, 118, all sin may be overcome by the Holy Spirit's power. Review and Herald, September 25th, 1900, to be redeemed means to cease from sin. Review and Herald, August 28, 1894, Christ died to make it possible for you to cease from sin. And steps to Christ, 39, Christ is ready to set us free from sin, but he does not force the will. That is where the key to this whole thing is, mm, that will. it's our will that is involved. It says in, uh, in Christ's Object Lessons 1, 312, it says, By his perfect obedience, he made it possible for every human being to obey his commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united to his heart, the will is merged with his will, the mind becomes one with his mind, the thoughts are brought into captivity to him, we live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with a garment of his righteousness. I wonder, brethren, whether God's people today have the will to go home to live with him. Mm. You know, in the sixth volume of the Testimonies, page 450, speaking of the message that was given in 1888, and was presented by Elder Jones and Dr. Wagner and Sister White in the years, the subsequent years, Sister White had this to say, had the purpose of God been carried out by his people in giving the world the message of mercy. That was the message of 1888. Mm. Christ would, ere this, have come to the earth. And the saints would have received their welcome into the city of God. Mm. Ah. That message was written at the turn of the century mm. in 1900, just at the time that Sister White was returning from Australia to the United States, 12 short years after 1888, the servant of the, the Lord was inspired to write that heaven could have been our home. Mm. That is how close we are today to heaven. And the reason that Pastor DiCarlo and Pastor Spear and myself and uh, my twin brother Colin in other round table presentations are so agonized over the issues that we are presenting in this round table is that we're tired of this earth, we're homesick for heaven. Mm. And brothers and sisters, this is the message. No new message, but this is the message which if we as a people will accept that message, then Jesus will complete his work in us and in the world and we will be sitting at the feet of Jesus. Amen. The greatest evidence, folks, that we rejected the message of 1888, that we're still here. 
I mean, she told us very clearly there in volume 7 of the commentary 984 that the fourth angel, Revelation, had come down to do his work. That fourth angel, Revelation 18, my friends, was to join with the third angel's message to swell it with a loud cry. The message would go to the world, but it couldn't go to the world until there was a people that would make a demonstration of what God could do in fallen human beings by overcoming every sin in their life. Not by what they do, but what they knew God would do if in them if they were willing to let him do it. That was the demonstration that God was ready for in 1888. And friends, it didn't happen. It hasn't happened, but it will happen. Praise God, it Amen. will happen. Amen. And it must happen. And I believe as I have traveled the world preaching this message, and I've, this year I've been over a lot of ground, let me tell you. And in every meeting that I am in, people are getting down to the experience on their knees, with their Bibles, with their spirit of prophecy, and they are coming into the understanding of that great dynamic message that God gave to the Seventh Adventist Church in 1888. They believe that God has enough power to keep them from sin in, in this life, and they're experiencing, and now they will soon make a demonstration around the world of the power of God. You know, I'm glad you brought that out, Pastor Spear. The situation sometimes is that God's people are alone or they're in an isolated area and they wonder just as Elijah mused is there anyone mm. what a thrill it has been for the three of us to go from continent to continent Amen. what an inspiration we three received in the Netherlands when men and women from over 30 nations came mm. and proclaimed their great faith in this message. There is a rising group of God's Amen. people. What did we find, uh, Ron, in Southeast Asia? Didn't we find the same knowledge, Amen. the same understanding, yeah. the same earnestness, yeah. the same desire? Yeah, 11 Brothers, countries. Yes, there were people from 11 nations that came to that camp meeting. I only wish that somehow we could make some videos that perhaps would show to people, men and women, from the nations of Europe, the nations of Africa, the nations of Asia, the nations of the Americas, the nations of the South Pacific, standing mightily for the truths of God, having a perception. Oh, what a comfort, what an assurance it would be. God is gathering those people. That's the great joy. He is finding men and women who are wanting with all their hearts and praying and mm. studying in order to receive that 1888 message Amen. again. Amen. Yes, we are at the edge of eternity. Amen. Amen. You know, I think there, Russell, remember in Malaysia that we had two, two men from India. That is correct. And uh, they came to us afterwards, and they were, we were preaching the 1888 message. That whole, that whole five-day conference that we had, camp meeting we had there, we were preaching this dynamic message of victory over sin, which is the 1888 message. And as they came to us, they said, pastors, please, please, there's 850 million people in India that have never heard this. You've got to come to India. Praise God, we're going to be in India now. Praise that's, the Lord. That's, that's right. And do you, I remember with Colin, maybe you were not there, when three of our wonderful German brethren came to us at the conclusion of the Hengelo camp meeting in 1991, there in the Netherlands, and they said, we have known the 1888 message, the details of it, uh, virtually all our lives. But this was the very first time that we heard it presented without a legalistic understanding. And what a thrill it was to hear about keeping the commandments of God under the mighty power of the faith of Jesus. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord that men and women are seeing this today in all nations. Listen, friends. The four volumes that just came out of the White Estates on the 1888 message, the Minneapolis yeah. Conference. How any intelligent, dedicated human being, whether he be a theologian or a layman or a pastor or a leader of this church, can read all those four volumes and then say the message of 1888 has been accepted. You'd have to be a liar. Because those volumes contain the tragedy of Adventism. And that tragedy is being extended year after year in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And friends, I believe that tragedy is about to come to its end. 
I believe now as you look at the the gospel workers uh, on 161 the, the, the prophet of the Lord makes this interesting statement the thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us not because of any merit on our part but as a free gift from God is a precious thought the enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. Mm -hmm. And for a hundred years, the devil has been most successful in keeping this glorious message away from our people. But it can't be done anymore. The devil's power is going to be broken now. This message is going to go to the world. It's going to go to the Seventh-day Adventist church first. And as it goes, it's going to spread out to the world in the loud cry. And the only thing that I can say, friends, may you be part of that message when it comes to its completion. I think we should share with our people the earnest prayers that we have had, those four of us who have have or who are participating in this uh, round table, this Adventist round table, we have been praying that somehow through very weak instruments God will present to our people a challenge mm -hmm. that these very videos that we are making this Adventist round table will be used of God in order to bring this great message with renewed vigor to God's people for we believe that we cannot any longer hold our peace. Amen. We believe the time has come that we should show ourselves to be faithful servants Amen. of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Amen. and faithful ministers to his flock. And our prayers day and night before each video presentation, not just at the conclusion as you see on these uh, videos, but before we deign to to make any one of these videos, we earnestly seek God's guidance. Amen. Morning in our private devotions, evening, look, we are asking God, and even during the presentations, we are silently asking God, please give us this message. May there be no fault in that which we present, Amen. for we recognize our responsibility before God. Now let me say this, that these presentations, are not in any way to attack the church. They're only to help bring reformation and revival, which Ellen White says in Select of Volume 1, 121, is the greatest need of the church. Mm. We're not going to start a, we've been accused of starting a church within a church. That is absolutely a lie. We would never do that. Not any more than any, than, than, than Ellen White would want to start another church. While well, she was here, I mean, she had tremendous disappointments. Uh, leaders stood up against her many, many times, and she, she, if it hadn't been the power of the, of the Holy Spirit working in her life, she would have been terribly discouraged. She would but have. she had faith it in God that God would one day bring a ch this church into the understanding of this dynamics of this great message of righteousness by faith, and that there would be, this church would be the church that would go through to the end. Mm. Now, I want to say this, that in all that we've said, please, we have faithful pastors. Amen. We right. have some faithful leaders. God bless them and give them courage and faith and strength. We, as the Firm Foundation magazine has gone around the world by the thousands every month, we, have, we get a significant amount of letters from pastors around the world that are reading that magazine and saying, praise God for it, we're, we're using it for our sermons. And as, as we believe this, there is a, a, a group of, of, of faithful pastors in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We want our laity to believe that, to understand that. And we are asking these faithful ones, as they preach these dynamics, of the great gospel of Jesus Christ in victory over every sin in their life that they were going to bring many, maybe hundreds of people to the great understanding of this message before, it's, before probation closes. May God bless you pastors for preaching it, for living it, because there is only one way. If you don't live it, you have no power to preach it. So live it, friends. Live it mm -hmm. with all the power that God will provide you. Live that message and you will find that you will change 
the attitudes of your church, the conditions. You may find tremendous opposition by preaching this message. You may find that men will go to the conference office and say, you've got to take the pastor away. He's dividing the church. My friends, truth never divides. Air divides. Mm -hmm. And when truth meets air, there is a division. Right. Two parties, she says, will, divide, will develop in the church. You can read that in Selective Message, Volume 2, 114. But truth does not divide, friends. But when truth, this truth, the 1888 message meets the air of the false theology that is being coming out of our pulpits, there is going to be a division. Believe me. But let's not give truth. Let's not blame truth for the division. Hmm. And we ask now, as we come to the close of this, we have to have a quick, quick summary because we only got about three minutes left. Russell, would you help us to bring this to a close? In summary, we would re-emphasize that the great 1888, 1888 message was presented to prepare a people in mm. purity for the coming of their Lord. Right. A people who would keep his commandments through the impelling power Amen. of the faith of Jesus. Amen. But Jesus would be the center of their lives. He would be their motivation. He would be their love, their joy, their expectation. And that message, although now 104 years old, is as new today as it was back there in that little church in the city of Minneapolis in 1888. I believe with all my heart that God is bringing his people up to the very same test. Amen. You know, the children of Israel, when they came to the borders of the promised land, they refused to go in. That's right. For 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. We have been in the wilderness Amen. now for over a century. Amen. But remember that the second time the children of Israel right did go into Praise the promised God. land. Praise the Lord. God, my dear brothers and sisters, has brought us to the banks of the Jordan River Amen. for the second time. Amen. We are there. This time, we will go in. Amen. The big question is, will I go in? Amen. Will you go in? That is the question that God is putting to us today. If we will only accept that wonderful 1888 message, heaven will be our home. God bless every one of you Amen. and make heaven your home. Let us pray. Pastor DiCarlo. Our blessed Father, God, it is with thankful hearts we think of the beautiful message you've given to us yes, as a Lord. people. The righteousness of Jesus Christ, the free gift to be bestowed upon any and every individual who would receive Jesus by Amen. faith. Amen. Mm. Lord, we pray, help us to have the faith of Jesus. Praise Amen. That we may be partakers of the divine nature. Amen. And thus, we may be kept in that beautiful relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, dear God, we pray. Please, God. grant us, dear God, the wisdom and the humility and meekness we long and need to carry forth day by day to live the life Amen. of Jesus. Amen. Burn within our hearts a love and a desire, dear Lord, to be more like Thee. Amen. And pray, dear Lord, to help us to give the trumpet a certain sound that Amen. we may in return help others to receive Jesus Christ. Praise God. Now bless us, we pray. Keep us close to Thee. Fill us with thy Holy Spirit and send your angels to watch over us. Yes. And to keep us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Praise God.